I'm Di, I'm from the Radical District Group, uh, and I'm, all I'm going to do is introduce Elaine, who's been doing a PhD uh, on Greenham, and she will talk for up to 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for discussion and questions. Um, so, just to uh, give some sort of background about the protest, first of all, just in case there's anyone here who's not really familiar with the Greenham. It, uh, it happened just over 31 years ago, in September 1981. Um, political campaign began that lasted for 19 years uh, and ended in Thank September 2000. Uh, the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp was born out of a preceding march from South Wales to the Berkshire military base by a group that called itself Women for Life on Earth with the subtitle of Women's Action for Disarmament. So, and that's this one here. Can I turn the lights off? Yeah, sure. This march was in protest of the NATO decision in 1979 to position 106 American controlled nuclear ground launched cruise missiles in the UK, the majority of which were to be held at Greenham Common um, from 1983. This decision was part of a NATO modernisation programme and was in response to the perceived superiority of the USSR. The total consisted of the deployment of 572 missiles in Europe. Um, this was seen as a, a renewed escalation of militarism between the East and West superpowers. Um, in particular, there was a fear that America could engage in what was termed a limited nuclear war from Europe. The problem was that many realised that a limited nuclear war for, in Europe actually meant devastation and destruction for all of us, but really meant not a lot for America, because they would really not feel very much for it. So whilst the rhetoric of the Americans and NATO collectively was that these weapons were a deterrent to the Soviets against launching an attack on NATO territories, it was also apparent that if America would not suffer immediate consequence um, of a Russian retaliation, then it was also conceivable for them to consider the use of the weapons based in Europe as a first strike against their enemy. Others also argued that increasing the number of weapons in, in Europe applied pressure on the Soviets, and which actually made the, the likelihood of them launching um, a missile more plausible rather than less so. In addition, the danger of misunderstanding and miscalculation um, on either side was significantly increased. As a result, the doomsday clock began to get closer to midnight, and nuclear war felt ever closer. Recognising the danger presented by such an escalation in the nuclear threat, many groups began to form or regroup in and around the UK. Some of these were associated with CND, um, which had been particularly active in the 1960s, but had gone through a phase of uh, sort of um, it was well, it gone through some splits within itself. And then there was other groups such as women's opposition to the nuclear threat. However, the group of women who came from South Wales and walked to Greenham, um, they were really more concerned about what the impact would be upon their families. Um, many of the participants had never actually been active in anything before. Um, the founder member of this march was Anne Pettit. Um, she was a trained teacher, in fact, she was my teacher at school. And um, she was the mother of two young boys. Um, she lived in a small home in rural Wales. And Anne decided, after having read about um, the Copenhagen to Paris Peace March, that actually something needed to happen here in the UK. So she decided to organise a march from, uh, from Wales. So she found some like-minded women, um, really through local networks. So she used things like the local health food shop to advertise. And she published, also went ahead and published in magazines such as Spare Rib, Cosmopolitan and Lake Weekly. And in the end, um, on the 27th of August 1981, uh, 36 women, 6 men, and 4 children set out from part of City Hall to Greenham. I thought they started at RDF Broadly. There is some debate about whether they did that actually, but the big sort of move, they, uh, they came from, because Broadly is actually in West Wales, yes, yes, yes. and there's another march that happened um, in about 83, I think, that went to, from part of again, to Broadly. So there's sort of two different marches, but there is some debate about whether this first one actually started in Cardiff. But the, the sort of main story, and even their own story, says that it started in Cardiff on this day, because they had a big event. 
sort of had, you know, yeah, the press yeah, the came launch, and they had the balloons and, the, yeah. you know, there's lots of photos. So, so for sort of, I think the idea is that they, even they say that he officially began in Cardiff. So, it, um, so, but contrary to their expectations, because they really thought this would sort of generate a lot of interest and people would come, you know, the press would be the group really on top of it. Actually, they really received very little um, attention at all. So, subsequent to that, around about in devices somewhere, they agreed that four women would chain themselves to the fence, very much like the suffragettes. So, they can be found there. But, um, and then another woman would walk up to the security, for, uh, you know, expecting lots of police and lots of security. Actually, what they found was there was just one security guard there. So, they presented their speech to him. <laughs> that was that. <laughs> And what they demanded was a televised debate on the subject of nuclear weapons, and they wanted the, the government representatives to talk to their representatives, very much like we have debates today, <coughs> on TV, and that they're often more stage-managed, I think, than anything, but that's what they wanted, they, they, they were basically told they weren't going to get it. And the base commander came out and effectively said, you can stay there as long as you like, as long as all I care. So that's what they decided they had to do. So they stayed one night and then they stayed another and then it carried on and eventually the peace camp was born from there. Um, slowly over the weeks and months and actually at the very beginning they did get down to a phase where they didn't have very many women at all. It was two to three at certain stages. Um, but gradually the word got out and people started to come. And Although many of the original marchers actually returned home, because most of them were quite a lot of them had young families and they chose to go home, many new women came to the site. Um, and then eventually the protests sort of evolved into more than one camp. So we got, we got the site map. And then on the box all around, there's the different gates. Now the gates were well, mainly the camps were at entrances to the back, to the base, and to help identify them, the women decided to call them the, the, the colours of the rainbow, which I think was quite creative. The idea behind that was this contrasted very much with what the base was about, which was very grey, and actually this was about. You know, they did an awful lot of this, making this a, a bright. Um, it's sort of a rainbow is also a symbol of life and various things like that. So sometimes it was called a, they were called colours, other times there was there's some indication they were also called uh, music gate or new age gate or something like that as well, depending on what women were there and what, what the focus was. Um, in February 1982 the decision was taken to make the camps women only. This was not an unproblematic decision um, because some of the women that, who were there at the time were unable to agree that the peace camps needed to exclude men altogether, um, nor was the decision necessarily a radical sort of feminist one. Some of the women there that did actually support the idea of becoming women only actually did it because they believed that the men were actually sought out by the press, so they would be the ones who were interviewed and not the women. Um, and there was also this idea that the police were also much, um, when they were doing things like becoming more militant, so they were being more uh, sitting and blockading the base, the police would actually pick on the men before they would pick on the women, so therefore there's this idea that it would create violence, which the women were um, not, uh, they were non-violent, that was their idea, that was their way of of protest. So after a sort of a very slow start really, this the, the campaign soon progressed into a you know, from a gathering of only a handful of women to a movement that's forced at its height by uh, several thousand women. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> then, um, what was called Embrace the Base, which happened on the 12th of December 1982, and then on the following day they had blockade groups, which was uh, slightly more militant, but it was presumably the most of the women who did the first day. The second day. Um, the level of action uh, was repeated on several occasions throughout the mid uh, the 80s, but it consistently failed to engage the politicians in Margaret Thatcher's government. They actually would refuse to speak to the, to the women. So there was no constructive debate, and, and as a result, the, the women, like I say, became gradually more militant. And by 1983, they were regularly entering the base as well. 
Initially, they would go. They seemed to go over the fence, and finally, after quite a lot of discussion, they then decided to start going through the fence. So they would start to cut the fence. Um, as a result, they became regular attendees in court, and they were often imprisoned. Um, and one of the women I've been researching lately, um, she's from Abergavenny in Wales, and she was sentenced in 1985 to 12 months imprisonment for two counts of uh, criminal damage, which she was affected by. Um, it seems to, to be the, the story was that she actually presented herself to the police because she wasn't actually arrested at the site, um, but a lot of other women were. So she got someone to take a photo of herself, cutting the fence, and then went to the police station and presented the photo and said, here I am, I'm handing myself in. But um, hers was more of a... Uh, she. She went there, really, her, her views were much more about religious grounds. She thought it needed to be, uh, that the actions of the state were immoral, and she used the court to give that statement effectively. Unfortunately, it's now disappeared and all of the other court records is no longer around. So. Mm. so she gave a long speech apparently, which actually was repeated. Um, people did get copies of it and it went round. So uh, an awful lot of it, from what I can gather, was about the morality of the state and how um, cruise missiles were effectively moral. Um, but she, despite this having this conscientious view, she was still sentenced to 12 months imprisonment, which actually was reduced on appeal to six months, but she still spent six months in prison for the cutting of the fence. Um, what's really important is that the women, though, remained committed to non-violent direct action. That, that the debates were around what was non-violent action. Um, but that, it seems to be that they eventually worked out that they could commit acts of against property but not against human beings. They couldn't inflict pain. So despite large-scale coverage of mass protest events, uh, the protests progressed, the authorities and popular media continued to publicly sideline the women. Um, as a result, participants um, began to review in depth how, their, how society operated. And gradually, therefore, the dominant protest narrative became more of a concern with the patriarchal uh, values that underpinned the entire political and social structure. For many, it appeared that the only the defeat of patriarchy could end the violence that we feel like the civil war. Um, this is a I don't see this situation being resolved by parliamentary means. I think there's more to it. I don't think disarmament is one thing we can achieve without the other bits of society changing. You won't achieve disarmament unless you remove the desire and need for men to fight. I think the future is at rest on women. Therefore, there was a growing sense of powerlessness despite their enfranchisement within an apparent democracy that appeared to define for many women the necessity of their participation within the movement. As a result, a mass of literature was created by the Greener Women, challenging the accepted position of women in society. In this, they began to promote new ways of being and actively encouraged women to work using direct emotional responses instead of traditional demonstration methods. Like many in the women's liberation movement, they argued for a system of governance through distributed leadership as opposed to the established political structures of the state and other organisations that place power in the hands of the few at the top seat, and often these of course would be men, and they actively adopted a new form of living in the camp, so it, no one was really in charge, which the authorities found very, very difficult to handle, because they would always say, take me to your leader, and of course there was no one to do that. Um, but perhaps most prominently, much of the women's writings began to urge women to step aside from the maternal concerns with the nuclear weapons and to question their roles as mothers and parents. So where the women initially had set out in order to protect their children, and that was the main narrative, this now seemed to start to shift. And instead their concern was to focus upon the end of patriarchy, which upheld the principles underpinning male violence in all forms. I'll read it. We see our stand against violence, ex exploitation and injustice as the basis of our feminist pacifism and our anti-militarist feminism. Um, the establishment and media, however, 
also focused upon these two broad categories. So you've got the maternal women and then you've got the feminist women. Um, and in order to dismiss them and their arguments. So, so we've got some there from various papers. And these are the ones which were you know, sincere <laughs> housewives, terrified, <laughs> threat of the media, or whatever. <laughs> So these are all the ordinary decent people. And then on the other hand, so these were the naive mummies and grannies for peace was another one. Um, we took, play, we took part mainly in these one day protests. So embrace the base was fine because it's all decent upstanding women. Um, but the next day, of course, you've then got the rule of the mob. Um, <laughs> So on the other side, we've got the radical, sexist, feminist, you know, these lesbian anarchists who predominantly, these live at the camp, you know, these constructive women. Of course, there's really no evidence that this isn't the case. They're actually the same women, because you've got them there on the 12th, you've got them there on the 13th, it's the same women. Um, So, though none of these characters is ultimately attributed with a role in the history of the demise of the Cold War, and I think we've seen that in the past week where we've actually seen Margaret Thatcher being presented to us as if she was the great peacemaker. So, the women don't get, you know, the people who are involved in the peace movement do not get any recognition for that. Um, and it's their, their protest actions have not been legitimised and therefore they've not really been celebrated. So, there's very little about just how much these women actually did and how hard they worked actually for peace. Um, and it's it's rather different to other protest movements, say for instance the suffragettes and this, you know the suffrage movement, the votes for women campaign, that is celebrated and also you know it's part of the curriculum in the school, but you don't get these radical protests really It's not there. That of course may be time, but interestingly when I was in school in the eighties it was talked about now. I don't know people and they don't even and they're not even that much younger than me, they can be five maybe to ten years younger than me and we've never heard of me. So I find that quite an interesting as well. Um, so it's however, that aside, it is still possible to sort of look and see that um, there is one version of the greener woman that we've talked about, which is the sort of maternal woman who is actually still she is still considered a worthy protester because she still exists this idea that women only protest when it's in, you know it's about their their children and their families. She's still there. So when Greenham is talked about it would be lost to be along those sort of lines. Um, <coughs> this is Sasha Rosenell who was a former Greenham resident as well, for instance, she has suggested that the women who participated in the role of mother inhabited a traditional female role, which is has which explains the motivation as a concern rooted in protecting the children. And she, but she went on to argue that um, it is a discourse women are able to mobilise without seriously transgressing the dominant gender relations that have structured their experience. Um, it is not notable that this analysis as a basis um, that it is the green and maternal character that's been portrayed as acceptable. Um, and in contrast, the the other women, the anarchist women, were viewed as something to loathe. They were characterised as the supporters of anarchy who had to be defeated if society was to be protected. This placed them firmly in the same sphere as the actual enemy, the communist USSR, which was also deemed to threaten the established Western way of life. Indeed, much of the commentary at the time explicitly aligned the peace movement with the Red Army and communism. There was even some uh, suggestion that they were all being paid by the government. In fact, um, there was papers released in 2013 from Margaret Thatcher's foundation that indicate the depth of concern felt by some UK advisers. A memo from Lord Belloff, a Conservative peer, to Margaret Thatcher, dated two days after Embrace the Base, um, showed that the women of Green and Common were increasingly being perceived as a threat. In particular, Belloff asserted that the danger arises from the erosion of the credibility of the deterrent and of the chances of multilateral disarmament. Whilst he believed ministers had already presented a good reasoning for the policy of defence to an open-minded and sophisticated audience, he implied that the broadcast of uh, demonstrations 
illustrated that there was a danger from another section of society which was susceptible to an induced mass hysteria impervious to argument. Despite the derogatory inference towards the intelligence of women, because obviously they're the same hysterical, hysterics, um, uh, the subsequent suggestion that their disposition, because he then goes on to say, made them liable to, to uh, manipulation by the Soviet Union because they're hysterical and therefore you know, they can't see that the Soviets are going to manipulate them and turn them into their dupes. Uh, it's also quite illuminating, I think, because it shows that there is a real concern that actually the, the women are gaining momentum. Their, their cause is starting to become public and it is being reported in the papers and 30,000 women do come and stand around the fence. So actually, I think what he, he then goes on to, to sort of... Um, he then goes on to say uh, to try to, that we have to do, we must abandon the kick gloves, gloves approach and seek publicly to discredit the Green and Common Women and their supporters in the country. Ministers must stop prefacing their speeches and tributes to their fine motives and tender consciences. This must help. To, this just helps to build them up. To do the reverse, we need a proper investigation of the background and characters of the Green and Common Women. We need to know more about their political and personal background so that the aura of martyrdom can be stripped from them. And he actually goes further because he then goes into having some detail about MI5 going um, into, the, into Greenham and finding out who these women are and who's paying them. And that seems to be the real thing. He thinks everyone is being paid and that they've got more money than the state are putting into candidates. Could it possibly be that normal people might actually support them? It can possibly be that. Anyway, um, so what we see is how the discourse, like feminist politics, um, it was deemed a threat to the status quo. In this case, of, of the decision to comply with the proliferation of nuclear weapons and what they were doing to try to silence it. Um, I think, as a historian, um, I think my work therefore has to be about how um, you take one version of, of, of a woman, who is the housewife, and then how you take the anarchist uh, woman on the other side, this character, and how it's been, how that has influenced the portrayal of the event subsequently. So whenever I'm looking into this in any depth, what have I seen, um, and the way that the, the and then how that then reflects on how participants themselves have actually recorded their, their memories. And I think for those whose identity was actually under attack, so anybody who was a lesbian woman in particular, or some who was acting against the norm, who didn't conform in this traditional sense, um, I think Greenham became a real source of strength for them. Um, and it's really important to actually recognise just how uh, this was a place that freed them from the patriarchal constraints that they had in society as a whole. They were no longer, you know, they didn't have to conform to this wife and mother stereotype. They didn't have to be different. They could just be who they wanted to be. It was a place where they could explore their consciousness and experiment with new forms of distributive leadership as well. As a result, much of their autobiographical accounts and yeah. academic works have emphasised and celebrated this aspect of um, in the process, it's interesting to observe that their accounts often seek to play down the role of maternalism though, so in a way they almost silence the other women as well, so promoting this idea of everything was, you know, about uh, being able to be free of yourself, actually then meant that anyone who was there, but actually was more, who was there for their children, who was there because they were, they had, like Anne Francis, who believed in more of a traditional view, they are actually silenced, so there's this, this other dimension where the, the green women themselves are silenced in each other. And again, I've seen that subsequently, because on the other hand, you've got Anne Petty, who eventually does write her memoirs. She says that um, uh, the te her text sort of um, seeks to undermine the radical side of it. 
So she writes, anyway, the emphasis inevitably began to shift away from opposing crews and towards the idea that what mattered was to create a space where women, by living together, proclaimed female values and the rights and wrongs of women-only protests seemed to have a the gathering place of arms race. And some of the women, now permanently at Greenham, um, had, which for some women, had evidently dwindled in importance. So from her point of view, she sees that the, the, the sort of um, focus on women and patriarchy is actually a distraction to the main cause which she thought was about nuclear weapons. So again, we have this sort of uh, two different versions of what the protest is about. However, whilst the political discourse emerging from the camps progressively became more feminist and more radical as the protests evolved, and the authorities actually became more aggressive in their response, uh, other women were still able to participate in the anti-nuclear weapons campaign without becoming so entangled in these debates. And how they did that was that they created a space away from them. So often you would find that women would go to Greenham, they would get an awful lot of inspiration, but then there was the great thing that happened after uh, the December uh, 1982 embrace the base, whereby the women there then decided this was a really great thing. We've got 30,000 women here, but they realised that that was unsustainable. You couldn't, women were not ready to break away from to normalise society in the you know, on Mars. So what they then decided to do was that was they created a sort of slogan which was carried green and home. So the idea being that women would go to Greenham, get their inspiration, and then take Greenham back to their uh, communities, which is what an awful lot of them did. Um, so this space, um, they were able to sort of use that, and I think just spend a few little, uh, a little, little bit of time going through some of the sort of, uh, things I've found. Um, so what I've got. Here, up here is on the 24th of May 1983. Yes, um, it was the anniversary of International Women's Day, and what happened was around the country, women got together in practically every town and every city, I think, in the whole of the country, and they took part in actions. And you've got various ones here, and some of them are just where they would show a film, you had things like uh, they had uh, picnics, they had um, theme days. Uh, I think in Bath, uh, for instance, they had 300, 300 women died in front of the abbey and placed gravestones, flowers, and photographs around. Then they walked through the town carrying a cruise missile and said, Who ordered this? and then they just dropped it. So, and they walked away. Uh, whilst here in Bristol, there were several hundred women involved in many different actions throughout the day, some of which involved playing on the theme of building bridges and not bombs, so they would go around and they'd have street theatre and, you know, try to engage people in this. And the idea was, of course, to try to engage the public in these actions and try to encourage them to get involved. But also, I think it gave women who were, who wanted to take a more feminist view as well scope to do so because there are an awful lot of um, instances whereby they they talk about um, burning bras and things like this and it was a myth that they, that never happened but it seems to have happened with Greenland. It didn't happen so much in, in women's liberation but it was this idea of um, that they were acting together as a sisterhood. So you have the sisterhood in Greenham and then you have everybody who can't go to Greenham doing this on their own. Um, this extensive and organised day that involved all of these towns and all of these cities actually was ignored by the international press. It didn't feature, which I find amazing, but that also just sort of almost um, supports the idea that the, the authorities of the state were actually trying to suppress quite a lot of what was going on. Um, because the, the general narrative, narrative that they wanted to promote was that the UK supported NATO. And I think some of the other papers that have also been released under the Freedom of Information Act have also start to show that the authorities were quite concerned with suppressing what was going on within the public domain. Um, then I think in... Yeah, that's just some of the sort of pushing... Push a push chair for peace because I like that one. Like, 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 like. 
Uh, and also, um, so in and that, the next year, in August uh, 1983, we had 20 marches um, from all over the country to arrive in Sweden on the 6th of uh, August for the Russian Day. And we had the most particular one, which is why I'm quite interested in it. It's quite a lot from Wales. There's Cardiff, uh, there's one from Bristol, there's Carmarthen, which is where I'm from, and there's um, it's quite a lot from all over the country. Now, I've interviewed some of the women who went on the Wrexham march. And um, actually, so what they talk about is that it's not so much, it's not so much of a feminist thing for them. Again, it sort of reflects back almost to the original march, where they take their children, they, some of them take their husbands, but they're much more in the background and are more supportive role. So they're able to be part of this movement, but still maintain their identity within you know, the life they want to lead as well, which I think is quite interesting. The other thing that's also quite prominent about their recollections is just how much they enjoyed this experience and how much being together as a group of women was, was you know, good for them. So, and it enabled them to become political and they learned ideas that they probably wouldn't have done. Um, so I think one of the things they said was uh, that actually one of the more positive things about this marching as well was that they were able to draw attention to the movement and they think they've done that so it was a uh, it, it actually inspired much more debate within local communities as well so Greenham could become very focused on the base and very focused on what was going on um, inside and what the military were doing what the state was doing on a much grander scale but often these little things that were happening in the local communities enabled people to actually spread the news of the peace movement and actually start to encourage more support. And that's what they felt their main contribution was. Um, and they got lots of support. Support that's not talked about either, because there's this great idea that they, these women were never supported. But there's one where um, one, one man, he's a driver of a, of a white van, so he starts beeping his horn at her, and she starts thinking, oh no, what's going to happen? And he says, hang on a minute, love, I've got something for you. And he thrusts a £10 note in her hand and says, I think you're wonderful, keep it up. So there's this idea that, you know, that they're not supported by men, but actually they really are. Um, and I think that's in contrast to a lot of the literature, actually, that is around about green you know, that's been published. A lot of the recollections, a lot of the green literature does tend to focus much more on how this was a women's movement and they you know, it wasn't supported by men. Men got quite cross about the fact that they weren't included and that C&D could never support them fully because they excluded men and these ideas. That's what's in the, the written text that have been published since. So it's interesting to see it when you actually interview people or talk to people, and that's not their experience of it. So, I think, really, Well, I've just got a few examples, but I know there's some funny to be able to have a conversation about this as well, rather than me just talk. So, really, I think that's just to sort of conclude, really, I just wanted to say that I feel that the, the women's peace movement during the 80s has actually shown just how extremely complicated and how complex and multi-layered the feminism was, and how the, politically it was, it was, you get different levels, you have the state, which seems to be this overarching state, but you also have different levels within that, and sometimes even the courts were, some would be lenient, some would be strict, and there's those sorts of things that sort of go on. And I think that looking at it on a more local scale actually gives you much more scope to see that, and you can pull out the individual cases and sort of tra track them through. And I think you get a much broader um, sort of view of what we want. Thank you. Unemployed, lots and lots of women signed on in Brixton because you only had to sign on once every six weeks and you never chased for a job. So, what it did do was provided this crossover which really made a really good anarcho feminist workings in Brixton as well. And um, you know, it started to have 
having women women only stuff at the, at the anarchist uh, bookshop, and you know it was a really strong anarcho feminist group, which was cross fertilised with Greenham. Um, you know there was there was, you know people could sign on at the peace camp. You were never chased to get a job. And we had to really struggle to get oh, the yes. rights to have it yeah. accepted as an address. Yes, but it was. That, that, eventually, yeah. you know, it, it, it wasn't easy getting them accepted as an address. It was part of the campaign. Yeah. But yes, it was 100%. Another thing, um, when you were saying about Karen Green and having another key sort of thing on the screen, women are everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, at points when we have like really massive numbers of arrests, um, they stop being able to do all the hearings in Reading and Newbury. So the hearings would be done in the local towns, which gave them. Yeah, I wondered about that because I've seen them in Swindon and I've seen yeah, them in yeah, Ellsbury, yeah. and I can't yeah. work out why they yeah, these I mean, ones were in different uh, For a while, I was um, living near Tottenham before I moved to Greenham. I was living near Tottenham, and so we. Um, we had a, a weekly peace vigil on market day in the town centre, but there was a very big women's centre, a women's centre with four floors in top this. So um, we had this big peace vigil every week, and um, we're coming up and doing partaking in, in big, big events. And so women were getting arrested at Greenham and then being heard at top net. And like one of the one of the sort of non-violent things that we used was the way. Um, a load of us went into, we filmed Totnes Court Magistrates Court, it was only small, and um, we all had balls of wool in our pocket, and as soon as this, the front of green women on, we just started throwing these balls of wool at each other, and we webbed up the entire <laughs> court, and the ushers were just didn't know what to do. They just couldn't do anything because in the end they couldn't move because it was all waved up. <laughs> you know, I mean it was it was really fun. I mean and then also we went and spray painted the you know, like in the middle of the night we went and spray painted the magistrates for you know, green and women are everywhere. And um, another thing that I obviously you've had to do a summary here, but another thing that really um, was a demarcation of the campaign because like you know that, that those very first initial things um, where we were doing Embrace the Base and the silos action and everything. It was part of the part of the analysis was that USAF were there on what was a common and it had only been made as a as a military base on a temporary basis for the Second World War. Um, and it had stayed, it remained a military base. So part of the campaign increasingly became reclaim the common. And when I went up and we were pulling at the fence and, and shaking it until the bits came down. That was very much what my vision was, not just about the missiles that hadn't even arrived then. Um, but, you know, once the missiles had gone, a lot of women just like dropped down the you know, and um, moved on to different things. But for me, it was very much like we haven't reclaimed the common yet. You know, and that's why a lot of women stayed on after that. And there were de notices. We were completely written out of any public um, access to the media in Britain, but we would be having journalists from all over the world coming to interview us, but nothing from Britain. You know. One thing I did actually notice, and say that as well, is that I, I seem to found that some of the more national papers, so more the London-based papers, so you know, even the Guardian, which was quite supportive at the beginning, yeah. that stopped reporting so much. But yeah, because they, well, they had denoticed yeah. on them. But it's some of, that's what's interesting, because some of the local papers in Wales that I've found, particularly around the Anne Francis campaign, yeah, so they were huge. They put it on yeah. front page news. There was big, uh, there was a three, for Anne Francis, a 3,000 signature uh, petition went to Leon Britton. That's never reported anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And yet they did it within 10 days of her being in prison. And it, it was local signatures. So 3,000 people from Abergavenny wrote yeah. and, and, you know, put their name to this was wrong. So, but that was reported in the local press. So in Abergavenny Chronicle, they have, you know, this front page. Yeah. So they, there's nothing in the in the yeah. sort of London. I thought that was really interesting. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. But we were still getting massive global coverage. Yeah. Yeah.
was there solidarity movements in America where the missiles were coming from? At that, yeah. at that time, there were several women's peace camps um, around the world. There was one in Hiroshima, there was one at Seneca Falls, there was one in Comiso, which is in Sicily. Um, and then there was a massive um, uh, sister sort of organisation in Australia built based around nuclear tests in the Pacific. Um, and also the uranium mining in um, Australia and the, Namibia, because um, I mean, we were very much looking at the nuclear chain. It wasn't just about um, the military-industrial complex, but that which we had a feminist analysis of, we developed a feminist analysis of, but it was global, yeah. And I mean, like, women for Green and Orbit were invited to go to Russia, um, Rebecca Johnson's a friend of mine, so you know, Rebecca, a group of women went to and um, were invited to go to Russia. Gaddafi invited women from Britain, you know, women <laughs> yeah. went, they went to Libya uh, as a, invited by Gaddafi, and they couldn't bloody wait to get back. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, this was all part of, like, oh, you know, they're being funded by Gaddafi, yeah. they're terrorists, you know, yeah. and now, we, well, now we're called um, um, domestic extremists, you know. Yeah. But, um, but that's, we were part, I mean, that was when we, that term was first come up with, the domestic extremists, the soft terrorists. Yeah. That, that's when it started. It didn't start, you know, in the 90s or yeah, now. Yeah. It really started then, um, the hospital occupation in South London, which yeah, was, a, was, hospital, riddle, was, a, was a nice place, little yeah. crossover yeah. And, and warm place to stay. Um, that was some of the stuff that was borrowed out of the, the police um, wagons that came to evict us. And that was, that was where the first we saw of it being talked about. We were soft terrorists. <laughs> and there was also there's also this link, uh, I remember, the link between the miners' strike and the women's yeah, yes. yeah. sick yeah. closures, and also with the black community, because the common thing, of course, was police, police violence. Yeah. So there was a lot of, a lot of crossovers. So yes. you're right, it's not right to see it as simply a feminist. There was um, also some things about the police because there's this idea that the police were all against women and women. But I found some instances and certainly some recollections, maybe from the earlier days. I mean, I'm not so sure, so sure about later. I did actually interview a police officer. Well, wish I hadn't interviewed him. He decided that you know, green and women. I think on one hand, he was talking about them all being shot, which was quite scary. I thought I should leave the room. Um, but some of the women talk about how. Um, at the beginning, they had police who wore CND badges under their, and they would sort of flash them to the women as if to say, "If you win, you know, by me, I'll look out, you know, I won't be so rough with you or whatever." There was this sort of talk around, you know, whether that was sort of around about the early stages of blockade base and, and also the Easter ones in '82, and whether that was when they were talking about. I'm not so sure. But I just wondered if anybody. Had but it, it seemed to be there was some suggestion. But I, I guess that's going to be true. We would have some. And there's, there really was a lot of um, support. There was a lot of supportive men. Mm -hmm. that we, yeah. It was only it was only men and women only in the outer darkness. Men were coming and going from camps a lot, not green gay, because that was a, a sanctuary gay, and that was off the road, and that was like please respect this is not for you know, um, and like. You know, in that sort of later on, once the missiles arrived, we were getting, you probably know about the era of the bailiffs and the evictions because they had a full time team of bailiffs and we were being evicted three times a day, you know, for months and months and months and we could not have stuck it out and didn't have that's, cars. That's it. Well, you know, you know these, uh, these documents that came out, the Freedom of Information, they talk yeah. about the bailiffs and how they. They were so, they really were very underhand about how they they were go, not going to tell you about certain things and we won't announce this and then and then I read in another book you were given sort of twenty minutes warning or something. This is at the beginning of the baby. Yeah. yeah. And you, and how it all built up and how many departments were all involved in this. Yeah. And one of the babies was yeah. the Hungerford shooter. <laughs> Turns out years later we found out. But some of them were so vicious, and the police yeah. were did a visual screen. Yes. And one of them was that Hungerford, the one that went in school and shot little kids. He was one of the babies. They were like psychopaths. And the, and the press, while uh, violence was occurring, would be filming somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I had a friend who was editing for the for the BBC, 
And of course, it depends who's editing the film as to what's put on the news. So yeah. people, they, they were already editing so it out. So they filmed it, it wasn't, wasn't, be wasn't going, being yeah. shown, yeah. I mean, I, there was an interview actually that I heard whereby a policeman, I, um, he was denying that any sort of violence ever occurred from his end. And then he said, but if it did, well, no one would have seen it anyway. I thought, well, then you're almost saying it did happen then, because what you're yeah, trying to say is, yeah. well, yeah. Well, yeah. no one would have seen it. Yeah. And another thing I like, what you said a bit about, like, it created a, 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 a place of community for women. And what happened was that, in, like, at times, women would come there to escape domestic violence. They would come there to young women, underage women, came to get away from abusive family situations. Yeah. And, and Part of the what we did by having that community, yeah, we didn't just talk about the, the, the military, was we talked about abuse, we talked about, you know, rape and incest and domestic violence, about things that were only just beginning to get talked about. It was gave us a space. You sat up there all night doing a vigil, you know, a night watch, waiting to talk vigilantes, you end up, it's dark and you start to really do consciousness raising mm -hmm. and it gave women a safe space and that was partly, uh, it was a massive contribution to a feminist um, analysis of patriarchy is to be able to do, it was just literally like being consciousness raising. But, yeah. you this is oh, really yeah. awful because we obviously we could go on talking for ages and I would suggest that perhaps some of the people having a particular dialogue go off uh, together up mm. to Trinity so you can continue the conversations because it's, it's the problem with this kind of event that you have to a day because obviously people are coming from the, the next <laughs> So I'd like to thank you very, very much indeed.